300 years ago uh, to the year uh, 1723. The pastor, uh, the theologian, uh, central leader in the Great Awakening, uh, Jonathan Edwards. At age 20, age 20, he penned several life resolutions, 70 of them, focused on life's purpose, uh, mission, spiritual life, daily disciplines, suffering, numerous subjects. In one of them, he focused on the subject of death. This is the resolution. Resolved to think much on all occasions of my own dying and of the common circumstances which attend death. We may or may not think much or often about dying or death. But in fact, Christmas reminds us that central to our Lord's coming was to deal with just that. What Paul, the apostle, calls the last enemy to be destroyed. And so we give our attention to another messianic psalm. And we see in a wonderful way the promise and the blessings that come. Uh, as uh, the Messiah deals with that last enemy, uh, the Messiah's ministry for us and to us in this way. So it's Psalm 16. Psalm 16. The superscription is a miktum of David, reference to a liturgical term, musical term. So let's give our attention to uh, God's word. It's a psalm of David. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they're the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my portion, my chosen portion, and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. What a rich psalm. Here is a, or perhaps the central point from this text. If the Lord, or we might say, when the Lord is your refuge and your delight and your counselor, he will bring your entire life, body and soul, not only through this earthly journey, but through death itself, into fullness of joy, and pleasures forevermore. That's a mouthful. But if the Lord is those things, if he is your refuge, your delight, your counselor, he'll bring your whole life through not only this journey, body and soul, but even through death and into fullness of joy. Now, if you're familiar with the psalm, you might be wondering about verse 10 as it relates to the central point. Verse 10 says this, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, the place of the dead or the place of the wicked, or let your Holy One see corruption. And you might already be familiar with the fact that it is quoted in the New Testament in at least two places in the book of Acts, both in reference to the resurrection of Jesus. Acts chapter 2, during uh, Peter's initial preaching, his sermon at Pentecost, And then later, Paul's preaching in Acts 13 in Antioch in Pisidia. Both Peter and Paul draw upon this psalm 
this verse to proclaim the Lord did not leave or he did not abandon Jesus to the grave, to corruption in the ground, to physical death, but raised him to new life. Wouldn't Jesus and his resurrection be the central point of the psalm? Well, it's kind of hard to say no. But here's how I would put it. Jesus and his resurrection are actually more the foundation that upholds and serves the main point of the psalm. The psalm begins with a petition. A petition from David. And the petition is important through the whole psalm. And it finds an answer at the end in verse 10 and 11. Here's David's uh, petition. Preserve me, O God. Preserve me. You read that and it's not initially clear what he's asking to be preserved from. But just to put it out there, it seems to be a petition, not that he would be protected from death, but preserved through death itself. That the Lord would not abandon his people, even in death, or leave them among the wicked. There's numerous ways that a person can be reminded or even jolted at times into the reality of life's brevity, its frailty, its mortality, a major accident, a close call with death. For many, it's the loss of a loved one, a close friend. The late anti-theist Christopher Hitchens, in an interview before his death and his uh, losing battle with cancer, he said, no one argues more strongly than me that we're born into a losing struggle, as is our cosmos, certainly our universe. In fact, it was Hitchens who said he realized his mortality and the reality of death, not as much at the loss of his father or mother, but actually when his children came into the world. He said, "I, I began to realize At their birth, I was being pushed along into that next season of life in a line of seasons that ends with death. Uh, Death is taboo in our culture. People aren't sure how to think about it, what to do with it, ignore it, cover it up somehow. No wonder uh, there is such a hyper focus, it seems to me, on the extension of life. How can we extend life? Anti-aging supplements, anti-aging foods, anti-aging creams. You do a search on top foods for anti-aging. What comes up? No, not beef. Not sirloin. In one search, number one anti-aging food, watercress. I read that, I thought, extend life, yes, but does it have to be from a steady diet of grass, okay? The the focus on extending life has been so strong, it's only been in more recent years that there has been a shift in the conversation to not the extension of life, but now quality of life. Well, David is going beyond both of these to the preservation of life through death. Notice the relationship between David's petition, what he's asking for, and what he does with that petition. He moves from petition to then declaration. So he makes the request, preserve me, O God. And then he declares something. He begins to declare several things. And that something is the ground. That's the reason that he hopes and he believes that God will indeed do this. Preserve me, for in you I take refuge. In fact, all the way through the first eight verses, this is what David is doing. He's grounding his hope that God will preserve him by declaring and exulting in who the Lord is to him. Who is this God? Who is God to David? Who is God to us? It's a central point that comes through the psalm. And what David does is so instructive, so helpful. 
When we have true needs, our hope, our dependence, our trust deepens when we choose to exult in the Lord. Uh, people might use that language, uh, a return on investment. A return on investment, of course, financially. But in all of life, there are so many things that can disappoint, that can let us down. Even the best of things can fall far short of filling us with the kind of life the Lord desires for us or that we need. But the Lord does not disappoint. Who the Lord is to us does not disappoint. So follow here David's mindset, his thinking, his heart set. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. David is saying, I am looking to you and I look to you for safety above every other way of trying to be safe. You are the safest refuge for me. It has been said safety is not found in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. That is true. Paul Tripp, in his book, Dangerous Calling, says, as a Christian, you'd better be ready to fight for the gospel, but you'd better also be ready to war for your own soul. We need refuge. Refuge from weariness. Refuge from ourselves and our own flesh. Refuge from the last enemy, death. Where are we seeking refuge in life? C.S. Lewis and his work, The Problem of Pain, he says, there have been times when I think we do not desire heaven, but more often I find myself wondering whether in our heart of hearts we've ever desired anything else. It's the secret signature of each soul. He is saying, as the author of Ecclesiastes writes, that, that God has placed eternity in the heart of man. By God's creation and design, it is in us, it's in our being to need and to seek some eternal home. And ever since the fall, man is searching for that home in anything and everything but the Lord himself. But like David, the believer has found his true home in the Lord. Through the work of Jesus Christ. But it's what David is, is doing with this found refuge that makes all the difference. Because the Lord is not only refuge for him, his home, but David's great treasure, his great delight. And you see that in verses 2 to 6. David writes, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. We have seen this language in other Psalms. I say to the Lord, Yahweh, you are my Lord, Adonai. I say to my Lord, you're my master. I have no good apart from you. For David, all other goods in his life are good because they, they give him more of the Lord. And he points to two specific things by which he sees God as his supreme worth, his treasure. One are the people of God. You see that in verses 3 and 4. As for the saints in the land, they're the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply their drink offerings of blood. I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. He values the people of God, not only because they are the redeemed, they are God's uh, personal possession, but when the godly are acting and living in godliness, he wants to be near that. Because his supreme value is God himself, whose character his people are to reflect. That desire for godliness and to be near the godly ones. That's, of course, in contrast to those who run after other uh, gods whose lives are defined by idolatry. And the second thing appears to be the land in verse 5 and 6. The Lord is my chosen portion, my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. That language of lot 
lines falling in places, beautiful inheritance. It's likely referencing uh, the allocation, the distribution of uh, the land promised to God's people into family sections and plots. And the words for all of God's people are to uh, remind and encourage a spirit of thanks and contentment in seeing how God arranges our lives. That we can look back on our life and see the hand of God, though in times of trouble and difficulties, his providential hand. And to be able to say, yes, the, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. The Lord is my chosen portion in my cup. You might picture a table with a thousand portions of food. And David is saying, if one of those were the Lord, was the Lord, that's what I would choose. He is the one who satisfies and nourishes like nothing else. The Lord is so good to people in providing food, physical food. Not only for our nourishment, but if you think about it, for our taste. He didn't have to give us taste buds, but he did. He didn't have to design us to need food so regularly, uh, daily. He could have made us like the camel, going for months at times without food. And yet as often as we eat to live and to enjoy, as good as food can be, you can only eat so much before you're full. You're satisfied. There, there's a limit to how much you can take in for satisfaction before it be, begins to create illness, sickness. But not this food. Not this food. Not the food of the Lord. You can't take in too much. The food of his presence, the food of his word, food at this table. The language of portion, lot, lines, pleasant places, beautiful inheritance, that may be literal, but it also may be figurative. It could be both. I mention this because the words pleasant places there in verse 6, the lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, is one Hebrew word, which is the same word used later in verse 11 for pleasures. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So verse 6 could read, the lines have fallen for me in pleasures. I have a beautiful inheritance. So pleasant places may not be so much a great plot of ground in Israel or Palestine, but the place of God's presence, the place of God's right hand. Perhaps a way of saying the Lord has given me the best ground, the best acreage right around himself. He is my refuge. He is my, my great treasure and delight. And then he is my counselor, my wise counselor. Look at verse 7 and 8. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. That, that the Lord is one's counselor is not some kind of add-on. It really permeates and kind of colors everything. It gives shape to the way he is our refuge and the way he is our treasure. God is our refuge, not in an automatic way, but in great part because as our counselor, he guides us away from danger. He guides us away from sin. He counsels us in the paths of holiness and goodness, true safety. Psalm 119.24, your testimonies are my counselors. One of my counseling professors, whom I got quite close to, George Scipioni, who's passed away now, he said a good counselor needs two things. A knowledge of the word of God, a good knowledge of the word of God, and skill. And you can have plenty of knowledge of God's word, but if you don't know the human predicament, the human situation, the complexity of that issue, your ability to apply it uh, may be quite lacking. Well, the Lord is our treasure, not only because of his glorious and beautiful character, but because he 
guides and counsels and speaks to us words of wisdom and truth and promise. He is our wonderful counselor. For seven verses then, David makes one declaration after another, one exaltation after another, in who the Lord is to him. Refuge and treasure, counselor. But then something shifts, something wonderful happens in verse 8. Because we, we might be wondering, what happened to the petition back in verse 1? David there said, preserve me, O God. Then he spent energy worshiping, declaring who the Lord is. And what does this lead to in verse 8? I've set the Lord always before me. Because he's at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Petition. He exalts in the Lord. He declares who the Lord is to him. What does this lead to but a greater confidence and affirmation about his request? Uh, to say, I will not be shaken, is a negative way of saying, I will be preserved. Like Paul's words, the last words that we have recorded of the Apostle Paul. They're writing to Timothy in prison, speaking of no one coming to stand by him. All had deserted him. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, that through me the message might be fully proclaimed. All the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. What David is doing is so instructive. In all of life, certainly amidst doubts and difficulties, fears and needs, may we go hard after the Lord. Reading, seeking his word, cultivating a heart of rejoicing in who the Lord is if we want to grow in confidence and assurance and hope. Confident Christians not only know the end for which they are destined, the end to which all things are headed, confident Christians fight the good fight to that end. Paul says, be strong in the Lord. How? Put on the full armor of God. That's what David is doing. And in this growing confidence... David gives a new statement in verse 9. Therefore, my heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. Verses 9, 10, the first half of 11 is the result. It's the remedy of David's position, uh, petition. And I love what David is requesting and what it reveals about our Christian faith. Preserve me. Lord, I shall not be shaken. Preserved from what? Unshaken in what? Well, it becomes quite clear as you move through those latter verses of 9, 10, and 11. My heart is glad. My whole being rejoices. My flesh dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. The request back in verse 1, preserve me, was this. Lord, do not lose me in death. Do not let me be lost or shaken from the realm of the living. Keep me body and soul forever. Key words are the word therefore at the beginning of 9. Therefore my heart is glad with the word for at the beginning of 10. Therefore, my heart is glad, for you will not abandon me or lose me in death. David's sure that what God has been for him as refuge, as treasure, as counselor, will not end at death. Think of the words of scripture, Mark 12. God will ransom. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living Psalm 49, God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol. He will receive me. Psalm 73, you guide me 
with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. With this great confidence, in verse 9, my heart is glad. By the time he gets to the end, it's all the more increased. In fullness and in duration. That's what you have in verse 11. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. What is that? I want that. At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Fullness and duration. Fullness of joy, pleasures forevermore. God is for the joy of his people. For our pleasure. Pleasure in him forevermore. But David knew, like we know, that he would see death that he would lie in the grave. So what did David mean? That he would see no corruption. Well, David knew, as was promised to him, that one would come in his line, the greater David, the son of David, the one who would sit on the throne forever and ever. And so the apostle Peter was right, right on when he was preaching at Pentecost. You can turn there if you want. It's Acts 2. I'll read several verses beginning at verse 23 as Peter is preaching. And he says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Verse 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And then he draws on this psalm. For David says concerning him, David says concerning the Messiah, I saw the Lord always before me. He's at my right hand that I may not be shaken. My heart was glad, my tongue rejoiced, my flesh will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You've made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that both he died and was buried. His tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Through Jesus, the long hoped for, the final king of all kings, though he would also taste death, before he saw the grave, he put death to death by bearing in himself the very cause of death, sin, our sin. And through his conquering the grave, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, the scripture tells us and gives life to us forevermore. So that even facing death, we can say with Paul, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. John Piper wrote this, and I'll end with this. Stop looking at your faith and rivet your attention on Christ. Faith is sustained by looking at Christ, crucified and risen, not by turning from Christ to analyze your faith. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, as your precious word calls us to fix our eyes on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith. We thank you, Lord, that we have these kinds of petitions uh, in your word, uh, petitions to be preserved even through death itself. And Lord, how we thank you that we have the life and the ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 
that firm foundation and then the giving and indwelling of the Holy Spirit to make it true, to make it real for us. Grow us, Lord, in our confidence and assurance of all that we have, who we are and who we are becoming in him. Lord, grow our hearts, grow our hearts' affection, our hearts' room to take in more of this assurance, more of this confidence. Lord, fill us even now as we, uh, as we endure at times. Fill us with joy. Fill us with this pleasure of which uh, David speaks, that we would bring glory to you, that we would indeed enjoy you. Uh, Lord, as our, our ultimate end. Continue, Lord, to be with us in worship. Feed us, we pray, Lord, from uh, not only your word, but from the table. For this we pray with thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.